Welcome to episode one of Les Odorants. Joining me today, I've got James. Hello. I've got Ben. Hello. And we are going to be talking to you about all things perfume. So the format today, we're going to talk a little bit about what we've been wearing this week. We are going to uh, catch up on a little bit of perfume news. And then in the second section, we're going to talk all about our topic of the week. Is anything really worth it? And uh, to help us with that, I sent both Ben and James uh, earlier this week some samples of some very expensive perfumes. And we'll be getting their thoughts on whether any of this shit is worth anything close to the sort of money that's been asked. Right, so let's get things started. Ben, apart from the very expensive perfumes, what I have sent you for review, what have you been wearing this week? So inadvertently, I've been wearing uh, Mask Milano uh, Mandala a lot. And it's basically because I've been, uh, I've been working at home with a deadline and I've been wearing the same cardigan, like a comfy home cardigan all week. And I got sprayed it on a bit of the cardigan and it just lasted all week so uh that's basically what i've been wearing all week nice yeah but it's a nice it's a nice perfume i, I don't know do you, do you know mass milano mandala uh, actually i don't um but mass milano and i have a slightly difficult relationship in the sense that i've only tried a few of them and i really didn't get along with any of them and i think it's tainted my impression of the brand particularly i fucking hated tango tango for me was just just smelled like a ball of rubber bands that had been sort of kept inside a burning tire or something it's just so kind of rubbery and unpleasant i hated it and uh, and for me i think that pretty well fucked the whole range tango's the big hype isn't it that one yeah everyone seems to love it james what about you what have you been wearing this week apart from the expensive shit what i sent you well, uh, I've been, I'm just looking at my notes here because I've terrible memory. Um, I was wearing Jacques Bogart Arabian Nights, which is like a kind of cheapy, and I've described it as a harrowing funk beast in the first uh, the first sentence <laughs> of my review. So um, it's yeah, it, it, it's a kind of really loud, um, annoying sort of fruity kind of tuberose for men. Uh, it's ridiculous perfume, uh, so I was wearing that. Uh, a little bit of um, vintage Koros, uh, an 80s one, um, and what else? Yeah, mainly the things that you sent me, to be honest, because I'm a good boy and I've been doing my homework. Um, so, you know, that, that's that's about it, really. Just to comment on Mass Milano, my, in the kind of mists of, of time, uh, I've forgotten what, what they were like, really um which you know isn't a great sort of um you know uh endorsement of them is it but uh yeah i thought i'd quite like tango i think and uh maybe that russian tea one was okay yeah they're all right you know i'm uh all right high praise indeed <laughs> see before we move on I, I do feel like i need to uh sort of fight my corner here because i think as a brand they're really good and i, I haven't smelt them all but Mandala, I think, is an excellent frankincense perfume. Like it's, it's basically like it's in that vein of like Avignon, things like that, with that cold frankincense, like very churchy incense. Cre- creativity wise, I, I think they're. I do think they're a, gr- a great brand. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not kind of um, too hard on them uh, from that perspective because I think they've done some really uh, interesting perfumes. But again, not enough to to pique my interest and, and buy them. But that's like most of, that's not saying much, you know, because I don't buy most perfumes because, uh, yeah, I don't have the disposable income to buy everything I want. Before we put it to bed, Hemingway is pretty much my favourite vet of a fragrance of all time. And we'll leave that there. You strike me as a sort of Hemingway character, really. Ben, oh, well, I'll take that any day of the yeah. week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I think uh, whether or not we are in love with Mask Milano is probably one worth coming back to at some stage on the <laughs> podcast. But I'd like to move us on a little bit. I'll just share a little bit about what I've been wearing this week. I was going to say, what have you been wearing yeah, this week? what have you been wearing? What have I been wearing? Yeah, so um, I have worn uh, this week um, uh, an absolutely brilliant perfume uh, called Greystone Castle by the World incense uh world incense is is this complete oddball character based in princeton in the states and he 
Um, he deliberately goes out of his way not to smell other perfumes so that he can be as creative as he can possibly be, which... On That's the one cool. hand, yeah, I, exactly, I agree. On the one hand, it scans as a little bit pretentious, but actually I think it's brilliant. It's it's real commitment to your art form uh, that you just so desperately want to be original that you try and avoid other people's work just so that you don't... Um, you know, inadvertently copy them. I think that's great. I think that's okay, providing that you already have, uh, you're reasonably well versed on what perfumery is and what's out there. Uh, if you're just kind of winging it as like someone who doesn't really know about perfume, but you make it, I know nothing about this person, by the way, but I'm just saying mm. um, that, you know, a, a certain person that we might um, touch on at some point uh, who didn't really have much <laughs> of a you know, um, uh, a grounding in, in, you know, classic perfumery or whatever. And I'm not saying that you absolutely have to. Some people might just be naturally talented and really good at it. But I like the idea of not wanting to be uh, influenced or having anything in your mind to, to copy it. Um, but I think also you need to have the ability to be able to copy it in the first place. So, uh, you know, there's that. there's that as well. Yeah, you need some starting point. I, I accept that. Um, yeah. But uh, Greystone Castle is a fantastic uh, perfume. It is very lemongrass heavy at the top. Um, it's got a really um, interesting herbal note called deer tongue. Um, but uh, despite being kind of quite out there notes-wise, it's actually really easy to enjoy. It's like a very, very grown-up Terre de Hermes. Um, I absolutely love it. And the performance, not that I'm a performance bro, but it is staggering for a sort of a clean citrus freshy that lasts all day long and smells natural throughout. It's, it's amazing. Um, and I, I, I genuinely, I, I really, I would recommend that perfume to anybody uh, without any hesitation. And I'm not getting paid for that. Not that I get paid for anything, okay. really. But Lemongrass is, uh, I think, a particularly sort of difficult material to use if you're going to use a tiny amount to kind of just brighten up your citruses and like, you know, it's a really good material, but you've got to be like careful that it doesn't smell uh, like too a Chinese too takeaway. Yeah, exactly. Or, or too, too sort of overpowering. So it'd be interesting uh, to, to, to smell that, you know, um, yeah. cause it's quite a delicate thing, lemongrass really. But uh, when you smell the actual raw stuff, uh, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty grim. Um, in fact, I've got a material here on my desk called uh, Litsia Cubiba. Cubiba. Easy for you to say. I know, yeah. Um, and that's very lemongrassy uh, smelling. Um, cool. Anyway, well, we shall have to we shall have to try that. Um, I've also been working my way through a sample set from a brand called Elisia or Elisia. Um, and uh, really enjoyed that. A couple of standouts, one called Desired and one called Odor Rose, which is uh, odd because I'm not really a big rose fan. Um, and uh, also I've been wearing a couple of Ensar Ouds. Um, I may, may just have been bitten by the bug uh, for Ensar Oud. A lot of hype around these perfumes, and I can see why entirely. I think Dan's bank balance is about to take a massive hit. <laughs> My bank balance has just been yeah. fucked. Um, yeah, no, so full disclosure, uh, the brand sent me a uh, a small bottle of Santal Sultan um, to uh, to review. Um, it is a reference-level sandalwood. Uh, I think it is quite incredible, um, and, uh, and I would send you both a sample, but it's literally like the tiniest bowl imaginable. Um, but then I also got... Um, which I bought myself, um, but I sort of ran a split on uh, Facebook groups to lower the overall cost, um, is uh, the new Tibetan musk eau de parfum, which has what I take to be a very realistic musk at the top. Like, it, it, it smells like an explosion of arsehole. Like, not Tibetan musk, <laughs> Tibetan, Tibetan arsehole is what I'm smelling like. Pow! Asshole, right in your nose. And um, it's awful, like horrific. I would not wish that on my worst enemy. But after five minutes, that sort of revolting asshole smell passes and you are just, you're just left with this incredibly classy, creamy sort of 
um, slightly irisy musk. Um, it's just incredibly clean and, and wonderful and it goes on for hours. Um, and it reminds me of a vintage fragrance, um, by Etienne Aina, uh, called Super Fragrance for men. I don't know if you've ever tried that. Um, it's sort of in that laundry detergent musk sort of, uh, style. Absolutely fantastic stuff. But that opening is honestly some of the worst minutes you'll ever experience. This is why I love uh, talking to different people because, Dan, most of those perfumes that you mentioned now is like not a fucking clue who, you know, never heard of them. I mean, I've heard of Ensar, obviously, but mm. um, yeah, so that's that, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Finding out things that you wouldn't... New shit. Wouldn't, yeah, exactly, that you wouldn't normally uh, seek out yourself or, or find yourself, you know? Indeed, indeed. Okay, so shall we do the news? Let's. <laughs> Rampant enthusiasm. Ben, what have you discovered in the world of perfume news? Uh, there's a new Etat Libre d'Orange perfume called Frustration that I thought looked really interesting. Boring. What's boring about that? <laughs> I mean, as a brand, I, I've not, I've never, I've never found anything by Etat Libre d'Orange that I have enjoyed. I'll be honest. Correct. There's not. Um, Everything that I've smelt by them has been just hideous. Yep. Uh, I've, almost unwearable for me. Wow. Um, okay. I've hated everything. Absolutely everything I've tried from them. Uh, fat Electrician, uh, which, you know, I probably should have quite liked. But, uh, yeah, just all of them. Um, I think because um, all I can smell is... Uh, Oh shit! What's what's the secretion one? Secretion magnifique. Yeah, all I can smell is secretion magnifique. With every every Eldo bottle that I pick up, my brain just tells me this is going to smell like secretion magnifique. And lo and behold, I hate <laughs> what comes out. I, I always got the impression when I smelt them, right, that um, they're made by someone for, who's from a different planet who's been told, oh, you've got to create a perfume. Uh, because their only sort of point of reference was perfumes from Earth, they bought one on Earth, took it back to their home planet and then just put it in like a black and white photocopier. And that's what that that's what you smell, like this kind of black and white sort of Xeroxed version of a perfume. And and that, that to me, they always have smelled like that. I don't know why I get that image of that kind of like, photocopied perfume but it's just they just seem so like harsh to me yep. and um like chemically and and like yeah it's very black and white um and 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 so that the, all the contrast is just really extreme um but having said that this new one getting back to the news uh, <laughs> i thought it sounded nice it, it, it's supposed to be um it's for, what was it they said a blend design to awaken the strength of your inner child if if for, if you like a little bit of marketing yeah um <laughs> The top notes apparently rum, cinnamon, cumin. Middle notes vanilla, vanilla absolute, and labdanum. And base notes Gaia coal, chestnut, and bourbon vetiver, which I thought sounded nice. It does. So it does. Yeah. It does. I, I mean, I have to say, uh, cumin stood out a bit, like a sort of sore thumb in that set of top notes. So I don't understand how that quite works together. And, and that probably for me is the the tale of Etat Libra. There's always something jarring, something that just sticks out and probably shouldn't be there. It's like uh, you know, it's, the, it's like the elephant in the tree. You're just kind of looking at it, going, "Well, how the fuck did that get there? It shouldn't be there. There should not be an elephant in the tree. There should not be cumin in this perfume." Well, just to, uh, I've been sort of conspicuous with my silence on that one. Uh, I quite like Eldo. Um, I, mm. you know, I'm. Uh, like I say, I quite like that kind of modern. I like the fact that they're a bit tongue in cheek. They don't really necessarily are sort of taking themselves too seriously. Although you could view it as they're completely pretentious and you know bullshit, uh, and a lot about the marketing, which is fine. But I think a lot of the actual perfumes themselves uh, are at least um, uh, somewhat interesting. Uh, I really like uh, Fin du Monde. Um, Mm. which has got a kind of gunpowdery sort of weird note in it, but it's kind of gourmand. It's very strange. Um, and, yeah, I, to be honest, when, when I say, you know, oh, I'm I'm saying they're okay generally as a brand, I own two. Um, but think about it, there's a lot in that line, and there's a lot that I would just 
would never touch and i think i only bought them because they were like dead cheap um uh, you know uh in on discount or whatever um but yeah i think uh yeah fin du monde is a good one fin du monde uh, i think would mean end of the world would it yeah yeah doesn't it have like a radiation sign yeah that's right that is a great name for a perfume well it's a great perfume if you it, i think if you give it a chance um it's very weird it's kind of like it's got like popcorn uh sort of notes like kind of um it's uh, it, it's very difficult to describe but it's got this slightly flinty you know like a, a a spark to it kind of thing so it's it's very interesting talking about our mate quentin beach uh he's done a perfume for them which is kind of just basically labdanum it's very nice it's called uh a Taquier de soleil marquis de sard which is a bit of a mouthful um, but nice. it's a very, if you like labdanum, it is the reference labdanum perfume. So, James, um, what what news have you discovered in the perfume world? So, uh, the news that I've heard this week uh, is that Penn Halligans apparently have a perfume called The World According to Arthur, which apparently has been out for a while. I think it's an exclusive in Selfridges because being the good boy that I am, as soon as um, we were having this as a point of discussion, uh, I rang my local Penhaligon shop and said, uh, have you got this? Can I sample it? Can I come and get a sample uh, this afternoon? And they were like, well, no, you can't because it's only in Selfridges. So, uh, and that will be the case until about March time, I think they said. Mm. So, um, yeah, if you want to try it, I think you've got to go to Selfridges. But the top notes are Incense SFE, Anyone know what SFE means? Uh, Absolutely no. 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 Okay. SFE. Um, Tahitian vanilla infusion. Oh, sorry. I thought you were going to tell us. <laughs> you don't know what that means. I'm either. not. Not a clue. No. Okay. Uh, good. <laughs> so, um, uh, Tahitian vanilla infusion, grapefruit. The middle notes are ambret firabs. Uh, that just sounds made up. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Um, Clara Sage, absolute. Base notes are Tonka Bean, Absolute, Incense, MD, uh, and Incense, Volcane. Uh, I, I mean, notwithstanding the fact that, that half of those notes sound like they were just made up by, like, a computer, um, the notes actually sound quite pleasant. Um, but for me, uh, the, the the whole Penn Halligan's shtick tends to be quite nice smelling stuff that is grossly overpriced. Yes, and also it's in the Portraits collection, and it has a dragon lid. There you go. That Portraits collection is is the, is the epitome of what you just mentioned, like yeah. grossly overpriced. Yeah. I, I actually, I'm going to stick my neck out and say there are a few in there that I actually really enjoy, but I'm not also going to try and fight any sort of defence for them that they're not grossly overpriced because they they absolutely are. I I, I don't uh, I don't remember. Uh, trying many of them i think there was one i did try that that was quite a lot like tobacco vanille which was not amazing maybe roaring roaring something roaring radcliffe roaring radcliffe that sounds about right they're all they're all mildly derivative and potentially not as good as the thing that they're derivative of so and probably more expensive or similar price yeah i like uh, cousin matthew is quite a nice pentagram fragrance that is very derivative but i like it as a summer like you know a, a light summer chuck um the other one i i do really like is monsieur beauregard uh, and i do i do actually quite like that is that like a chicken head that one that's the one yeah yeah it's got a rooster yeah i quite like that one yeah. kind of purple juice as well that's it yeah yeah having said that i bought them in a sale for 75 pound and i would say that's about the price i'm, I'm, I'm comfortable paying for them correct yes so I think Penn Halligans really are in their sort of element when they're just doing their normal line of like slightly shavy type vibes. I agree. And and in fact, I've just been rummaging around in the cupboard to find uh, Lothair by Penn Halligans, which yeah. is absolutely superb. Um, and I've just sprayed it. I can't remember what the actual notes are, but it, it, it smells like sort of lavender maybe grapefruit um uh 
uh, maybe is rhubarb. It? Is it? Yeah. I don't know if there's a rhubarb note to it, but it's got. It's a bit like some of those very popular ambroxan and grapefruit bombs that you get now, but without all the ambroxan and sort of um, you know. Uh, diffusive madness it, it just smells yeah. a bit more natural and pleasant um, but I absolutely love that I got that for about 30 quid in their unboxed sale um, oh well that's so. excellent you know again price wise uh, I, I think it, you know they are they are up there um, and it's only at moments of weakness that you would go in that shop and maybe buy something uh, full price uh, or if if ever um, another thing that I just want to mention because while, while we're on the subject of um, I, t- talking to uh, go, going into a store, and especially when it's a Penhaligon shop or whatever, and talking to the staff in there, um, I like to do that um, and find out what the best sellers are. And th- you mentioned it before, Halfetti Hal is it called? Halfetti Halfetti Hal Cedar is the one that's getting a yeah, lot of not, love. Not that one, the original Halfetti, right? Right, outsells all their other perfumes combined apparently right uh, and basically their whole like business exactly the same with dior by the way apparently uh they're you know because everyone goes on about the uh Privé line and all that when in actual fact a lot of it's irrelevant because the only perfume that's really sort of viable like business-wise and, and keeps the whole thing ticking over is uh oud ispafan because it sells a hell of a lot more than any other same with probably creed with aventus or whatever so mm-hmm. really uh, all the others are a bit of a you know, uh, a, bit, a bit kind of irrelevant. Um, yeah. And if you if you like them, you're sort of lucky that they're there because they're all there off the back of the sales of their top seller, um, which usually uh, sells out all the others many, many times over, which is interesting, isn't it, really? You know? Yeah, no, it really is. And, and Ispahan, the, the, the Dior one... Um, I'm I'm reasonably confident that they pump that through the air conditioning in Harrods. I mean, as soon as you walk into Harrods, <laughs> you just hit like like a wall of of scent right in your in your kisser. It's uh, and it's Ispahan. It's uh, it, it's absolutely enormous, and it's a fantastic perfume, and completely understandable why it outsells all all the rest. Uh, anyway. Um, as master of ceremonies, I must move us along. So coming up in part two, we're going to be talking about whether anything in the perfume world is really worth it. Stick with us. All right, welcome back. Thanks for being with us. We're going to get stuck into our second section now, which is going to be a long-form discussion. We're going to talk about whether any perfume is genuinely worth it. Now, being a Instagram... Ugh, I hate the word influencer, but I've got a reasonably... Lothario. <laughs> being a handsome Instagram. Yeah. No, uh, being, uh, you know, essentially doing reviews on Instagram, I've got a reasonably uh, large uh, following on my page, and I am very lucky as a result to be sent stuff for review by brands. Um, some of that stuff has absolutely, uh, you know, extortionate retail pricing. And uh, what we thought would be interesting would be for me to send some samples to uh, Ben and James um, of some very expensive perfumes. These are all typically kind of um, north of 350 up to about 500 pounds for varying sizes between 50 and 100 mil. But, you know, this is premium priced perfume. And just see whether the guys thought any of them were worth anything close to retail pricing. So... The first one is by a fashion house called Rubius Milano. It's a a perfume called Blue uh, by Quentin Biche. Um, It retails for a staggering £500 for 50 mil. Uh, It's about £10 a mil. So uh, the second one is Royal Crown Imperator or Imperator. Um, It's a unisex perfume from 2018, Italian brand Royal Crown. Um, That retails for £450 for 100ml, so about £4.50 per mil. Um, The third one was Clive Christian's 20th anniversary fragrance, released a couple of years back. Um, That retails for £375 for 50ml, so getting on for, what, £8 per mil there. And then the final one was a perfume 
perfume by uh, Julien Raskinet, who's done some amazing work, um, for a brand called Elegantes. Their perfume is called Heart, and that retails for £500 for 100ml. Um, so, James, how did you get on with them, and was anything close to being worth it? Well, it's it's first of all, and again, I don't want to go too deep on this, but it's obviously it depends on what you value. Personally, I have a, a, a an upper limit of what I will spend on a perfume, and all of these are in excess of that. <laughs> right? What's your upper limit, James? I don't know, two hundred and fifty, three hundred quid, something like that. Um, again, volume's not really important because I've tons of perfume, so. Even that could potentially be for a fifty mil, let's say. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, as far as these are concerned, so least favorite was um, the uh, the crown, the royal crown one, mm-hmm. uh, Imperator. Uh, nothing wrong with it. Um, I just uh, I've kind of smelled that before. I got kind of weird sort of top note of uh lavender which is kind of strange so before i even sprayed it i sort of like smelled the 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 vial um and i get this kind of overwhelming sort of vanillic kind of like smell and then obviously sprayed it on and yeah it's a dry woody incense type generic sort of uh accord can't really like pick out any oh there's some fantastic natural material again you know my thoughts on that. Not that it really mm. matters. That it's got loads of naturals in, but I didn't even get a kind of a sense of like church or what you know, whatever people normally. It was just a kind of by by the numbers uh, sort of thing, softened with vanilla, which to me is a bit of a uh, a strange sort of juxtaposition. And it smells like in the same way that like Cedrat Boisi is like a a kind of weak rubbish kind of a ventasy thing and a, a milky creamy uh insipid vanilla perfume sort of smashed together that, that's kind of what i got uh from this and i have smelled it before somewhere i don't know where uh it's not bad right it wasn't like it it it, it, it did get on my tits a little bit after a few hours but then i go through a sort of transition and it becomes like oh it's kind of okay um so out of all of them i didn't dislike any of them really but that was my least favourite. Okay. And uh, Ben, how did you get on with Imperator? I'm going to agree with everything James just said, except for I'm going to flip it on its head and say, I actually really enjoyed it. But I don't disagree with the thing that you just said. I think it's a, a quite a bland, uh, sort of like dark, woody sort of fragrance that, like you say, they just sort of added this kind of vanilla vibe to it. Reminded me a lot of uh, Memo, Shamsud. Uh, but Shamsud is like very basically the same fragrance, but without the vanilla. Um, it has that. It, it's like relentlessly dry, dark, woody kind of incensey thing. Um, and Memo for me are a brand that are pretty much bang slap middle of the road average as all hell. Um, which should sort of so that sort of describes what I thought about this. Having said that, that vanilla. I quite enjoyed. I did enjoy it. I liked it. I like. I, I thought it had like a really showroom opening with that cardamom and vanilla and iris. Um, you, you, you can't really go wrong with that as an opening. It's very big, isn't it? And soft yeah, and fluffy, and it's easy to like. Yeah. Sorry, um, I, I I neglected to say that I did like the opening of it. Uh, it does have this slightly herbal sort of effect. And the thing is, sometimes you have to spray a perfume various times. So the first time I judged it. Second time, I was like, mm, I, it, it, it kind of the opening is better. So I actually reapplied it during the day. So I did wear it this week. Um, but it's just one that, you know, um, I, I wasn't that enamored with. And I think it probably plays into your hands, Ben, because you, I think you've mentioned that you're a kind of, you, you tend to underspray yes. uh, or just use a kind of light application. And I think for a, a, a perfume that's just for, uh, it, kind of ease of, of wear and you don't want to get too uh, emotional or you know <laughs> emotionally involved um, then it's it's probably a good uh, good choice but I personally uh, especially for the money I think in the context of the money which is coming back to what we're talking about um, I didn't find it uh, particularly impressive and you know I think if you were spending that much on a perfume you really should be 
uh, being sort of, uh, you know, uh, spellbound by it, and I wasn't. I, th- I think that's a completely fair analysis. I think for four hundred and fifty pounds for a hundred mil, you would expect to be spellbound. And and what I found um, was probably somewhere between the two of you, uh, experience wise. I enjoyed it. I thought it smelled very nice. Um, if it was fifty or sixty quid, I'd be like, yeah, this is great value perfume. Four hundred and fifty pounds. Mm, probably it's a bit of a stretch. Um, that said, I have tried a few by Royal Crown. They do tend to make very fancy presentation and they make very strong, very durable perfumes. And uh, again, full disclaimer, whilst I'm not a performance bro, I think it is nice to be able to spray a perfume and be able to smell it a few hours later rather than just have it vanish like a fart in the wind. That that plays into the, the value for me. Like, like I'm not... Like, I don't want, like, massive performance. I don't need, like, huge perfumes that I walk into the room and everyone smells me. I don't need perfumes that last forever. But if a perfume lasts, like, one, two hours, instantly that's not worth it for me. Like, no. I just think, what's the point? I don't care how much it costs. I'm not going to buy it. Um, and but, but saying this one about the value of this one, um, you know, I think to sum up whether I thought this one was worth it, um, I, I, I messaged Dan saying, if you still got a bottle and you, you know, you're looking to sell it, let me know. Because I enjoyed it, but I wouldn't buy it retail, but I'd buy it cheap off Dan second hand. <laughs> well, I think I, th- I think that that is the story for a lot of uh, uh, you know fragrance enthusiasts, especially with that, you know on social media. You get used to not paying retail anyway. But um, there are certain perfumes I will pay retail for, and certain ones I won't. I was very glad the brand sent it to me for review. I very much enjoyed it, but personally, no chance that I would be parting with four hundred and fifty pounds for that one. Um, okay, so I think we're agreed on Royal Crown Imperator. Oh, it's probably worth just me reading out the official notes because I thought it was interesting that you both got uh, that vanilla experience. Actually, I did too, um, but the uh, the official notes uh, are cardamom, nutmeg and olive leaf. Uh, laurels, I have no idea what that is. Um, laurels smell uh, beautiful. Uh, right. Is, uh, uh, laurels are for resting upon, are they not? Um <laughs> are, 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 <laughs> Iris, rose, I didn't get any rose at all. Uh, Olibanum, which I think is a... Um, frankincense. Uh, resin. Resinous sort of uh, fragrance, yeah. Is it, uh, oh, is it frankincense, Olibanum? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, cedar and myrrh. Um, okay, so um, I didn't really get incense from it. I didn't really get rose. Um, I get the seed. It smelled to me mostly like cedar and vanilla, if I'm honest. Um, maybe with a little bit of uh, uh, something herbal going on. Uh, very pleasant, um, totally inoffensive, definitely not worth the money. So, Ben, which was your least favourite of the fork, assuming it wasn't Royal Crown? And this is easy. This is this is this is this is dead easy. Um, so, my least favourite of the three, and I think the one that I the thought four. was most like yeah, the sorry, the four, and the one that I thought was most egregiously overpriced. Uh, was the Clive Christian 20th. I, I thought that was... Uh, it's flip-flopped somewhere between toilet duck and something that was quite restrained and quite refined, on the other hand. But generally, I thought it just very quickly started feeling quite generic. I thought the opening was quite unique. It had this like quite strong sort of yuzu and rosemary vibe. That, that I thought that was quite interesting. And that kept that that picked my ears for about a, a minute before I started, like I say, feeling like it smelled a little bit like toilet duck. And then I thought it it transitioned into the dry down in, in, in a, into a very soft vetiver that I couldn't help but feel just smelled cheap. Interesting. Interesting. I've got something to tell you about this one as well, but I'll save it till after. James, what did you make of the Clive Christian? Well, it's rare that I've tried a Clive Christian uh, before, you know, uh, you, you would have potentially sent us this. But I did try this one um, when it was, I think it was exclusive somewhere. I think it was in, I think it was in Manchester, actually, in uh, Selfridges. And I did try it and I really liked it initially. Uh, I thought it was really good. So this is a kind of revisit for me to go, OK, let's let's really break it down. Um, I think the main takeaway from this is that um, rather than being sort of safe or your royal crown trying to do something, I think in fairness to Clive Christian, 
they really do have some quite out there perfumes if you if you really go through the the line and again i'm sort of alienated from buying them because they're, they're, they're too expensive um but uh, i i i did get a load of samples off them once and they were really interesting this one uh, i get i sort of get the, the the toilet dog thing um but it's a kind of weird aquatic uh very fresh uh top notes certainly i can get the the the, the yuzu or like a grapefruit type uh sharpness um that yeah kind of terpenic sort of uh sharpness but what i really get from it is a celery note so uh a lot of people don't like celery um and it is actually quite a strong thing because if you think about celery it's quite a watery uh veg is it vegetable i don't know what is it it's a stick (laughs) It's the devil's work. <laughs> well, I, it's surprising because you obviously really like this and I really get quite a strong celery vibe from it. And I know um, from obviously dabbling with uh, bits of perfumery myself that there's quite a few ways that you can get a celery vibe. And I also got a slight maybe like fenugreek, like a kind of slightly curry leaf um, sort of effect from it, but with this weird aquatic thing. And when you sort of you know mention all those things together... That's a pretty, you know, out there kind of perfume. So fair dues to them for for doing that. Um, but as in terms of its wearability, um, I, I didn't actually wear it this week, so I can't really speak to that. But I think it would. It's one of those that uh, certainly couldn't justify buying it, um, and I don't think it would be that rewarding an experience for me. But in terms of like creativity, and for that to be the twentieth anniversary perfume. I think that's quite a brave um, sort of move because it is not it's not a crowd pleaser. <laughs> I don't no. think. No. No, so 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 let me share my my take on on this one because uh, for me in in some ways this is the one I've got most to say about from from this group. This is the only one that I purchased with my own money out of the four. Um and um I find the opening it's not I don't smell celery. Uh, but I definitely get that fenugreek thing, um, and I think I said to you, James, that for me it's it's almost like a sort of uh, it, it smells like a curry at the beginning um, because I, I remember thinking to myself, but this is such a clean uh, citrus vetiver. Why does it smell like a curry at the top? It's it's very peculiar, um, and I I did wonder whether my bottle was off, um, and and it's it's not it's not. I've tried I've tried it uh, from other bottles, exactly the same experience, um, and and I don't particularly care for the first few minutes, but that fenugreek note does disappear, and then um, I think when you call it toilet duck, you're you're maybe doing a slight disservice <laughs> to me. Yeah, just slightly. It's a very very like hyperbolic. Yeah, <laughs> of course. I I think. I think it is a really lovely, very, very, very clean, uh, and I, I use the word clean a lot, but I think it is a very clean vetiver. It's not a sort of rooty, damp, earthy sort of thing. It it, it smells like polished and 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 uh smooth and I, I really enjoy that and that with the citruses and the fact that the citruses actually again go on and on all day um is, is for me uh actually genuinely quite interesting as a perfume um i've not smelt many perfumes that can pull off that long lasting citrus thing um i mentioned greystone castle at, at the beginning of the program but that's probably the only other one um and i really do like uh, uh clive christian 20th anniversary but i totally get the idea that it's not really very wearable and, and i'm wondering it's one of those perfumes that just sits on my shelf and i wonder whether i'm in love with the idea of owning it rather than the idea of wearing it um which I, i'm increasingly aware that i can be with some perfumes but of the lot it's the one that I invested my own money in. I did not pay full retail price, disclaimer. Uh, I paid about half price for it, which I think is fair. Um, and I feel like it, it's got resale value at the same sort of price. So I don't worry too much. Generally, 
I don't mind paying a lot for a perfume if I've got some disposable cash and I feel like I can sell it on if I don't love it um, and, and not lose too much, that's fine. I very rarely buy things that I think, shit, if, if this doesn't work out well, I'm going to take a massive financial hit on it. Um, this was one of those. Um, but yeah, I paid my own money and, and of the four, it's probably the only one that I would genuinely keep um, if, if push came to shove. So a couple of things you said about that, though. Um, I think the the fact that it's such a clean vetiver is actually the reason I, I don't like it. And it makes me feel, for some reason, and this is ridiculous, but for some reason, clean perfumes like that, I, I just feel like they're cheap and they, they don't have that kind of chic element of kind of, you know, high fashion for me or something like that. I don't know. I don't know what it is. What? It just feels like because that vetiver is so smooth and it doesn't have that spikiness, like, like if that vetiver was more raw, more earthy, a bit kind of spikier, I think I'd appreciate it a lot more because I do like the opening to a degree. And and, and I, I agree that that, that, that fenugreek, um, I, I wrote in my notes that for the first hour, it smells like a bit like a citrus version of Eau Noir with there's like a, a lavender and fenugreek in there. And that's very like, you know, reminiscent of Dior Eau Noir, which is my favourite perfume of all time. Um, so I, and, I, and I, when, I, when I smell it, it was like, oh, this is almost like, it's, it's not a flank or anything like that, but it could be like a citric flanker of Eau Noir, you know, it's, or a citric take on Eau Noir. Um, so I didn't enjoy that part of it. To be honest, I just I just found it drab once it, that that vetiver started coming out more and the citrus started dying back. Mm. And I think I would like it a lot more if that vetiver, like I say, was like spikier, earthier, and a bit more rooty and and rough. Uh, I think the fact that it was so smooth just made me sort of just deflated I, me a little I, bit. I think perfumery is all about balance, and if you haven't got something in there um, to counter uh, that then, yeah, I completely understand. You you need that kind of earthy element. Uh, however, have you, have you ever tried anything from uh, Peck G? No. Um, so, yeah, uh, Omar uh, Peck G is a, a Turkish um, artist, perfumer, and he's got a, a fragrance called Omer, I think, which is like O, oh, like the French for water, uh, M-E-R, Omer. Um, and that is quite similar to this, sort of reminiscent of this. And he had, does have another one with a really heavy fenugreek um, note as well, which um, was, was was really reminded me of this. And that's quite, you know, um, sort of a, a good thing for Clive Christian and for him because it's kind of, you know, a very expensive perfume kind of smells like that and an independent indie kind of arty perfume, uh, you know, so it gives uh, Clive Christian a bit of uh, kudos. Okay, great. Well, uh, that's the Clive Christian. The official notes for those who uh, want to know them are pink pepper, mandarin pettigrain, yuzu, rosemary, Haitian vetiver, and cedar, um, which uh, doesn't seem completely uh, off from what we all thought, except uh, we all talk about fenugreek and curry, so who knows. Um, Okay, um, thanks for that, guys. I want to just come back and get your thoughts on the last two. Um, Rubius... Uh, Milano, Bleu, and Elegante's Heart. Ben, how did you get on with those two? I really like Rubius. I thought it was the the, the Rubius Milano one, um, Blue, uh, or Bleu, or whatever. I thought that was really good. Um, I could see why you liked it, Dan, because Mm. it's got that kind of sort of uh, barbershoppy, clean, soapy, almost like slightly vintage vibe, like as an undercurrent, like runs underneath it. Um, but I really liked it. I thought it had a lot of development for a perfume. I thought it was, it certainly wasn't linear. It, it definitely like jumped through a few kind of rings. Mm. Um, but I, I did really like it. Um, I thought it, it, I fe- it felt complete and quite well rounded for a perfume as well. I felt like it was very, um, yeah, there wasn't any kind of gaps or holes or, or, or bits missing to it. That said, it wasn't really my thing. I wouldn't wear it myself, mm. I don't think. Um, it was very masculine, mm. I thought. And I, I, I have to admit, I don't tend to wear like that masculine stuff. Um, or or the stuff that I wear that's masculine is not masculine in this way. I say this had a very sort of like barbershoppy kind of vibe to it to me. Um, that That is probably not my cup of tea. Um, but I did really like it. Um, 
yeah i thought it i thought it was nice i thought it was i thought it was in it quite 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 well realized like i say like like and it just felt like a very complete picture mm. and and the elegantos as a boozy perfume I, I i was quite impressed with the the boozy note of it uh and i thought that the boozy note in this smelled very ex- like did smell very expensive because it had this like uh like dry sort of smoked woody quality to it that, that almost like like almost like like casks um uh, you know that's the kind of images that it kind of struck into my mind and, and I, I was quite impressed with that and I think booze notes are, are one thing that in perfume they can they can go horribly wrong quite quickly um and and I was quite impressed with it in this I, I thought it was quite a realistic like photorealistic boozy note but at the same time it didn't feel alcoholic and trashy which is where I think sometimes booze notes can can quickly go wrong I think they can feel a bit bit sort of thin and trashy sometimes whereas this it felt nice to me i thought it, you know it felt it felt thick and, and and quite satisfying and at the same time it felt boozy but it didn't feel sort of crass and in your face mm. um didn't feel alcoholic so i liked it um i, I thought it was the opposite I, i'd say in my notes i've put it, it's the opposite of imperator it, it had like a bit of a bad opening that didn't really impress me but i i really enjoyed the dry down whereas imperator was kind of the opposite to that it had that big showroom opening and then it kind of just went into this woodsy vanilla thing this i thought was the opposite mm. didn't have too much in the opening but i thought it turned into something very nice but generally i've put in my notes that i don't remember the feeling this but i've put fairly uninspiring in my notes <laughs> so that, i guess that sums it up damning with faint praise there james how did you yeah. how did you get on uh, uh with yeah with these two um probably probably better uh i'll start with the uh elegantes heart one because i'm wearing it today um bizarre because i i spritzed a little tiny amount of it and i was like wow that is a boozy top note that's too much um I, I, and I, I thought that it was this kind of uh thin transparent overly boozy like sharp you know really um high high pitched sort of booze thing and then it maybe would go into like a kind of saffrony twangy leather kind of thing um which is totally not what this perfume is at all it does have that boozy top note and it's interesting that um i i mean i know of using rum absolute which is a very expensive material uh and it does give a really unique sort of character and some of that like cask uh element and I don't know whether that's what's going on in here, but I also, with it being by Julian Rasconet, we know his love of uh, Woody Ambers. And I would say this is a really bombastic, big, uh, quite feminine um, amber floral, I would say. Um, it's quite thick. Uh, it reminds me of the kind of thing that, like, maybe a slightly more mature um, uh, cosmetic counter lady might be doused in um you know that kind of either like really heavy patchouli or like um really sort of yeah like a big ambery sort of floral uh it's quite like dry like like potpourri kind of vibe on me now which probably says maybe there's a a, a some sort of floral absolute in there i don't know um but it's it's not typical of rascone in terms of it being this really woody amber thing but it it kind of is I don't know. It's a bit of a confusing one for me. Uh, the boozy opening's good. It's very complex uh, and probably worth the money if you, if you're into that kind of thing. Yeah, five hundred pounds. You think it's worth five hundred pounds? Not, not for mil. me. No, I, I, there's no there's no chance. But um, if you uh, have, you know, like I say, if you've got the money uh, and you're impressed by by it, then why not? Um, sure. But, Sure, sure, but I mean that's the same for anything. But I mean, d- d- for me, no. But the, in the in the in this context, none of these. Uh, you know, if we if we go to the Rubius Milano one, which I mm. absolutely loved and was my favourite of the lot by like a country mile, uh, f- that's the most expensive one as well, and I still wouldn't buy it. Mm. You know, um, no. because it's out no. of my kind of wheelhouse. However, uh, I will just talk about that because. Uh, I I did say to you before I'd even tried it, I think I know what this is going to be. And it's, again, not me being a smart-ass. It's me kind of just thinking, I know 
uh, uh, Quentin's sort of style, uh, and I'm, I was anticipating what it was. And I got that, but I also got more than than that. So I think some of the other ones that he's done, like uh, Bois Imperial for uh, Essential Parfums, he's done uh, Terrible Teddy, which is linking back to Penn Halligan's, another one that he did, which I actually quite like, kind of fruity incense. And obviously those um, uh, Mark uh, Antoine uh, Barwa, uh, those ones that he did for him, uh, again both really brilliant perfumes but just too much for me they give me a kind of not a headache but kind of like fatigue uh after time of of wearing them uh because they are just so much and they're so multifaceted they're, they're almost like uh like uh, uh cosmic they're kind of the uh like like nebula or something they're kind of like very colorful to me this kind of fruity incense like bejeweled vajazzled kind of uh mm. you know uh, incense vibes but then when it dries down it was actually quite creamy with a kind of uh m- quite masculine sandalwood sort of uh accord um which i i just thought it was fantastic uh i can't really mm. and, and it was much more wearable than all those other perfumes that i mentioned because they're just slightly more high pitch and i don't know if that was because th- there's a little bit more refinement because it's for this really expensive brand. I I, 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 can't, I can't really say, uh, but I just personally uh, preferred it to some of those. And I love some of those other perfumes that I mentioned. So, you know, that was a big winner for me. I don't know if it's marketing hyperbole or what, but um, I read that Quentin Bish was told by Rubius, um, no budget. No budget limits at all on this perfume. Just make the best perfume you possibly can. Um, and then, you know, we'll deal with that. Um, and I don't know whether that's true. I mean, it's a, it's a great sort of marketing thing to write. Uh, but I felt that on this one, I could genuinely smell quality um and uh for me it, i mean I, I get slightly different experience than you guys but for me this is a sort of slightly powdery leather uh almost like suede sort of experience and it is very i think it is very masculine i think it's marketed as unisex but it is very masculine i suppose i, I get i get the barbershop reference to some extent but but for me it's mostly about leather um it, it being quite a polite sort of way not like butch kind of motorbike um like, like that laurent mazone hard leather kind of thing nothing like that this is this is soft um you know not animalic glorious and, and there's that word again clean but it, it really is it's it's a powdery absolutely leather, um and i love absolutely it. well i i'll just say i'll just finish my full appraisal right because not mm. only do you have all those things in the beginning of it which some of those other perfumes that's all they do so your your um your essential parfums uh, bois imperial which is only 60 quid for 100 mils right and that's all i've got a bottle of that coming oh this great week. well that's that's all sustainable and recycled glass and i love what that brand is doing right i think it's i think it's brilliant and i think they've got really good perfumers on board and they've done but but you can tell that that is a, a cheaper sketch sort of version. This, um, again, you wouldn't know, personally, I wouldn't know that it was such a creamy, powdery perfume from the opening. So you've got all that spangly, um, incense type stuff that I was talking about. And then you've got this creamy, sandalwood, iris, powdery sort of thing. And I did mention a perfume to you. I don't know whether I sent this message because I might have not i might have written it or not sent it to you whatever but it did remind me the powdery notes in it reminded me of um donna karen uh fuel do you do you get that kind of yes thing to it yeah yes yes i totally yeah. get that i totally get that and i i, I do have uh, uh donna karen fuel um how so. how wonderful is it though that a perfume can take you on that kind of journey to have such crazy top notes to have there you go so you have you have these wonderful kind of uh, sort of nebulous in a good way uh, sort of top notes that are kind of all over the place, and you don't really know what to make of the perfume, and then to have this kind of dry down that then you go ah it reminds me of this now, 
Um, I think yeah. that if if anything adds value to a perfume, if you're getting an experience that lasts for a few hours uh, and you're getting different things from it, then that could be someone's perception of of, of value. Um, and yeah, so that's 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 my thoughts on it. I did absolutely love it. Uh, I'm gutted that it's five hundred pound because uh, there's, there's there's no chance in hell that I would buy it. If it was two hundred and fifty quid, I'd go mm, you know uh, for fifty mil. I go, mm. but five hundred is like nah, no chance, man. Five hundred is just two lots of two hundred and fifty, James. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And if I was flush, and maybe I was in the shop, and you know, I uh, maybe you know having a bit of you know a chat with. The, no, I still wouldn't. Sorry, five hundred quid's too much. I couldn't so, do it. Okay, so so I I I completely understand that that point of view. Five hundred pounds is too much, and I think we're probably closing in on a view that, on the whole, uh, perfume is worth whatever you're prepared to pay for it. But there's no objective uh, definition of value. None of these perfumes automatically said yes, this is a five hundred pound value of perfume. Um, but. Uh, the one thing I will say is I was having a discussion with a guy the other night who refuses to spend any more than £50 on a bottle of perfume. He has over 500 bottles of perfume. 500 bottles of perfume at £50 a bottle. 300 of which are shite. <laughs> well, I, I, my guess is 484 are shite. <laughs> but, uh, but, but why not? Why 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 define these arbitrary limits on an individual bottle price if you're then going to just not cap the number of bottles you have? I think you know if just being you know purely economic about this and 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 thinking in in cold hard rational cash terms, why not just set a value limit on the amount you're prepared to spend? on your collection and then worry about fitting around the thing. So an individual bottle, I think the, the price of an individual bottle is irrelevant. Um, well, it's not irrelevant. Obviously you have to have the cash, right? But, but like, I, I guess, I guess I would spend a thousand pounds on a bottle of perfume Sorry. rather than, well, I would rather than 10 pounds, uh, rather than a hundred pounds uh, on each of 10 bottles if I felt that that £1,000 one was so sort of, you know, distinct and, and special to me that it was worth 10 other bottles. But the absolute value, the absolute price, and, and I have to be careful not to confuse price and value, but the absolute price of a bottle of perfume to me doesn't matter. It's about the relative price to other bottles of perfume and how much more you like it. And I would cheerfully throw away 20 bottles at £50 a pop right, in order to land another bottle of Rubius Blue, I guess. So, you know, which you know, I wouldn't even have to throw away 20. It's 10, isn't it? I'd have to throw yeah. away 10 50-pound bottles for one bottle of Rubius Blue, and I guarantee I could do that. I guarantee it because I've got enough 50-pound bottles in my collection that are shite. Yeah, no, I I, I, I can see the, value, the 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 point as well in in having that relative value and, and, and say that because, I mean, ultimately that's... What it comes down to, it's, the difficulty is obviously, you know, how do you qualify value? Because it's for, it's going to be different for so many different people, isn't it? Um, and but for me, I think I, I have an upper limit, like like James, same as James. Um, and I didn't think any of these perfumes were worth. I wouldn't have paid for any of these perfumes. I've I've broken my upper limit once in my because all, all four of these perfumes were more than my upper limit. Um, okay, I've broken that once, twice in my life. Um, what for? That was for a, a Dior Au Noir, uh, which was a huge bottle, so I, I kind of justified it that way. Was that when it's still in shops? No, it was after it was discontinued, So, that, which was the big reason I sort of decided it was all right. Plus, I was like, I'll decant it. And then, of course, I got it and was like, no one's having my precious Au Noir. <laughs> and I've never decanted any of it. Um, and the second perfume that I broke it with was um, De Cita Oud Infini. And oh, yeah. I genuinely think that it's worth every penny uh, i i smelled it and i was like i I just blew me away and I, I still to this day like and actually it was in a way it was my reference point for when i smell all four of these perfumes i thought if any of these rocks me as much as Infini did then i'll 
you know then that's clearly worth it you know uh, because they're about the same sort of price um and they didn't they didn't come anywhere close to it for me when i sprayed oud infini that blew my head off it it just was something else i've never you, there was something so so opulent and rich about that perfume i think it's a lot of it's in the rose um but it it, it just blew my head off and, and and none of these did i've never tried it it's um i've, uh, I've never tried it ben I've never tried it. <laughs> I'll send you some. Um, oh, the way. Yeah, great. <laughs> Personally, uh, I I wouldn't wear uh, Oud Infini just because I have worn it numerous times and uh, it's slightly it's slightly too uh, animalic for me. But here's some factors that um, uh, Pissara is a wonderful perfumer. I love some of her other work. I love the hay notes. I love the uh, the floral absolutes that she got. The the kind of freshness and then she's incredible all, with florals. Yeah. So Pissara Uma Vajani is is uh, she has um, a really good grip of the, the 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 florals and she gets this kind of hay note. Now either that's from hay absolute or Tonka. She gets this really good sort of like juxtaposition of the really beautiful uh, uh, absolute of like jasmine she uses a lot of jasmine um and and that kind of thing so i actually really like her perfumes i think i think they're excellent and then oud infini was like completely out of like left field um yeah. to be this really animalic um almost like an ode to those kind of you know co- i mean it's many times more uh, barnyard and kind of shitty than uh, chorus or whatever but it's got that juxtaposition of the clean exactly what we we're talking about before you need the clean and the dirty to kind of just do a little dance and fuck and whatever uh and become like one thing and that is exactly it's a cohesive perfume it's a brilliant perfume i just don't want to wear it and i don't really want to own it but and also the reason if we're coming back to value in terms of natural materials there is definitely a thousand percent real oud in that perfume right mm. and you can smell it immediately and that means that there's a certain amount of, um, you know, uh, expenditure, you know, a certain amount of uh, raw material cost in that perfume, which justifies a high price for it. So, um, you know, that's what a lot of people, uh, that's their, where their standards are. They say, oh, well, you know, I want loads of like natural materials in it. That is there in abundance. I, I, I think it's a great perfume. It's an example of a perfume that I can say is great, but I don't ever want to own it or wear it. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but, but, but God bless you for wearing that thing because you, you've got to have some fucking, you've got to have a big set of cojones to wear that thing. Yeah. Sounds wild. Okay, well, I'm looking forward to trying that one. Um, so I think uh, there's an interesting point you touch on there, James, about the uh, raw material costs because obviously stuff like uh, proper oud um, does cost proper money. Um, but it seems to me that um, actually the raw material costs that go into perfume actually don't really determine the price that significantly. I mean, they, they may provide a license to charge more, but I don't think, uh, you know, when, when we're paying whatever it is, five, six hundred pounds for an NSAR oud, I don't think there's five, six hundred pounds worth of oud in there yes there's real oud yes these things have been sort of uh tinctured by uh you know a, a guy who who knows his craft and 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 yes these are relatively expensive raw materials but the price to produce that perfume is still small relative to the, the sorry the cost to produce that perfume is still small relative to, to the price that it's sold for correct um, and, 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 and that, that, that's just business though in it that's that's of economics course. we we all know that that is the case and there's a certain degree of you have to accept that and as a perfume fan you have to accept that because that is across yeah. the board what every perfume is. Uh, I think when you've got lots of distributors and different people uh, involved, then obviously, and and the fact that you buy a lot of stuff that's marked down, right? Mm. Think about those discounts that they still sell that. Everybody has to make a profit. All that stuff, you've got to take all these things into account. And people who don't uh, are you know, just you know, narrow-minded or whatever. You've got to understand mm. that that is how things work. So 
yes, there, there is that. But I think when you talk about an artisan making, a, a, you know, a perfume and uh, potentially uh, sourcing the oud, which again, I have kind of, you know, uh, oud is endangered. So, you know, I don't necessarily think all this wild oud is such a great thing. But anyway, um, let's say other materials that are expensive um that there's there's a perception of uh, uh value in that and obviously as a small producer you can't buy in bulk you can't uh be part of you know a process of uh getting those materials in in large amounts you're doing small batches so you're not going to have the economy of scale to be able to uh get those materials uh, as cheaply as you know uh potentially some bigger brands could or whatever so there's lots of factors to it um, and I still think perfume is essentially uh, worth whatever somebody is prepared to pay for it, uh, mm. and that that is all we can kind of come to a you know consensus on. Um, that that the, that's what it is at the end of the day. And I completely get your angle on it, uh, Dan, and what you were saying, Ben, about uh, breaking your limit. I have broken my limit. Uh, I went to uh, New York to a wedding a few years ago. Uh, and I was walking around and I really don't like Bond Number no. 9 as a brand uh, for various reasons that I might get sued if I say, so I'm not going to say it. Um, but uh, there's certain things I really hate that brand, right? And I don't like them. But I walked into a boutique after walking the High Line, which is like a kind of disused uh, railway line in uh, New York. And my missus was like, oh, I really like this High Line perfume. And it's a bit of a kind of nostalgic thing. Oh, let's buy this. So she bought that. And I ended up buying some ridiculous $400 perfume that I fucking hate, man. I can't stand it. Right? I've, <laughs> s- I've still got the thing. I'm going to sell it. But, um, you know, and it's so strong. It's ridiculous. And I don't know what I was thinking. I bought it in the shop and I was kind of under pressure. And when you've got, you know, your bum bag full of like, you know, uh, uh, traveler's checks or, well, I didn't have that. But you know what I mean? You've got dollars on the hit on your hip uh, to spend you you might just go oh yeah for and then you think oh four hundred dollars that's only two hundred quid but it isn't yep. it's actually significantly more than that so uh, there's certain circumstances where I will be uh, you know coerced or uh, certain situations where I might I might I might spend over what I say my limit is so you know it makes a bit of mockery of having a limit but you know um, got to have a code and you got to have exceptions Ben I, go on. Yeah. Well, I, I think as James said that, like, um, you know, like as perfume enthusiasts or, or whatever we want to call ourselves, um, you you kind of have to come to an acceptance of that fact that by design the industry is overpriced. You know, like 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 perfumes are not worth what they ask if if you look at it in pure material terms. Um, you know, and I think you have to kind of make your peace with that early on otherwise it will just eat you up inside right um and i think that's why we all kind of you know in a, in a, in a way i think fundamentally that's why you ask this question is is, it, is anything worth it and you know we all have our upper limits apparently like um you know dan doesn't seem to but i bet even dan you you must have a limit somewhere and and you know i think we all kind of come to those limits because we've all kind of you all kind of make your own peace with the fact that ultimately nothing is worth anything and 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 these these, these perfumes are all significantly overpriced um and yeah. because of that we kind of justify it in our own ways right and i think that's probably the ultimate answer isn't it that we're I, all just I, I trying to justify is. it no I, th- I, th- I think that's absolutely right you know is anything worth anything the answer to that question is the stuff is worth whatever you are prepared to pay for it that you know no more no less um th- I think the the point that comes through loud and clear for me is that there is no intrinsic value in perfume. Now, some of it might be worth more, but some of it may cost more to produce than other stuff, okay? And, and some of it may have more craft and intellect poured into its development, and some of it might be marketed better. But if you strip it all back to the bottle and its contents, what you will find is every single perfume out there, you know, even the 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 the, the t- for ten pounds in 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 you know super drug or whatever. Um, and and by the way, there's probably some quite decent stuff for that price range. I'm not having a go at it, but all of that stuff, all of it, is making a profit, right? So 
the real question is not is this intrinsically valuable it's will i fucking pay for it and the answer to that is based on how much you want the stuff no more no less true let let me just posit this 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 notion right that um working the other way around so let's talk about really really cheap materials so let's talk about a formula like uh baccarat rouge 540 right mm. <laughs> uh which which is clearly uh you know a, a real success story of marketing or somehow you know getting out into being this kind of huge thing that it became now if you look at that in terms of the actual uh materials that are used it's very cheap right <laughs> very very cheap to produce there is nothing in there which is an expensive a particularly expensive material um and but what i love about perfumery and what i think is great is that to take something that is really cheap materials and to make it more than the sum of its parts so you're making you're paying effectively for the uh the the skill of the perfumer and all that kind of stuff so there's a there's a uh a, a, a perception of value that, that is attached to that. So how much do you uh, rate a perfumer's skill? I think it's a brilliant thing for someone to take, you know, uh, materials that are commonly known and to bring them together in such a way that goes, oh, that is a unique accord or a new style of perfumery. Uh, whether you like it or not, I think you've got to accept um, that I think, you know, that is kind of one of Francis Kirkshen's, you know, best perfumes that he's ever made. Um you know whether you uh sort of like it or not um it's been very successful and uh it's clearly you know elevated his uh company and everything into a status that i would have never anticipated mm. um yeah I, look i i, I want to wrap us up a little bit here um but i think finishing on baccarat rouge is is an excellent place because um you know as you say it costs the square root of fuck all to manufacture it's a very simple thing um and uh, it's incredibly easy to reproduce. It has spawned an entire army of of identical clones because it's just chemicals fizzed up together in a precise sort of uh, uh, you know recipe, uh, stick it in a bottle, and away we go. There's a reason why it's been cloned so many times. Um, one, it's it's brilliant and innovative. Um, two, uh, it's actually cheap as fucking chips to produce. Um, and three. It's grossly overpriced. Grossly overpriced. Two hundred and eighty pounds for seventy mil is absurd when you can buy the precise same formula in a bottle by you know Johnny fucking Cloneworthy uh, for you know Tuppence halfpenny. Um, you know these brands with their prices are creating the market for clones, but that. That is a discussion for another day. So I want to wrap us up here. I think in conclusion. Anything is worth whatever you're prepared to pay for it. No more, no less. We've all had a chance to smell some really interesting perfumes and I am indebted to you guys for talking absolute bullshit with me for the last hour or so. Um, and I'm indebted to you, our listeners. Hopefully, guys, you didn't find that too tedious and you'll join us in two weeks for episode two. James, Ben, any final words from you guys? Nope, that's about it. Thanks very much for listening. Cheers. Yeah, thank you.